I'm going to reposition quickly. Zoom in there, the lioness is there. The lioness is in your shots, just zoom in and on the right. Hello everyone and welcome to the Maasai Mara in Kenya. It's five o'clock in the morning, we've been out all night. There's a lioness with three tiny cubs just in front of us. This is Safari Live. Ready, go. Thousands of wildebeest are coming across this river. This is why we came to this area, to tell the story of the migration. The buffalo bull charging straight at the hyenas. Now the whole herd's coming. Look at the crocodile coming after them. Never had any doubt as to who the real royalty of the wilderness is? Well, now you've had that cleared up for you. Here's a lion. There's a lion right next to us. Oh, my goodness. That one's down. That is unbelievable. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to Safari Live Migration. The journey has just begun. We're coming to you live from the Maasai Mara in Kenya, where one of nature's most astonishing spectacles is currently underway, the great wildebeest migration. Outside, it's a moonlit five degrees, no, five o'clock. It's 15 degrees Celsius and 59 degrees Fahrenheit. My name is James Hendry and I'm going to be talking to you from this, the migration control suspended some 1,000 feet above the Mara floor, where if you were watching the Earth Live Spectacular, you will know that we have had three teams out following lions on the hunt all night long. As we speak, two million wildebeest, zebra and Thompson's gazelles are streaming out of Tanzania and into the Mara. They are being followed closely by hyenas, cheetahs, leopards and lions. Over the course of the next eight weeks, we are going to be following the triumphs and tragedies of all of the migration's great characters. But because this is live and totally interactive, you have inadvertently become the main migration character. We'd love to hear from you. You can send your questions or comments to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. And the first thing I'd like to know from you in no more than 140 characters is what you're expecting from this great migration epic. Let's take a look at where we find ourselves on planet Earth. We are zooming in from outer space down to Kenya, the southwestern fringes of that great country, and into the 370,000 acre Maasai Mara, the stage for this spectacular epic saga. Now, you've just met Scott Dyson. He's sitting with, I think, nature's most cute animals. Let's go and find if the rest of the Angama cubs are with him now. So, welcome back. The cubs were just saying hello to mom and they've just tumbled down that little tuft of grass behind where she is now and they're very very playful they've been playing with one another the whole evening and lots of tumbling around and tackling one another they tiny little fur balls i can't wait for for you to see them they're probably going to pop up at any moment they've been trying to actually nurse their mother but she is not interested so she's obviously given them some milk quite recently and she actually moved off from where they were. Now they've followed her back to the spot. She's looking quite hungry, so who knows? Maybe a little bit later she'll hit off hunting. Now she is one of four lioness that have a total of, absol of 13 absolutely adorable little cubs, the oldest of which are about six months old. Now while we wait for them to pop up, it's very important that I mention to you that it's absolutely pitch black around us. It is a full moon, so there's a bit of ambient light, but this is a very special low light camera. 
which is allowing us to film these animals without interfering with them at all. If we were to be shining spotlights now, it would be creating a bit of attention to this uh, situation. And because the cubs are very small and vulnerable to hyena, other lion, we want to be as sensitive as possible. So by being under the cover of darkness without shining any lights, using the special low light camera, we're getting these special glimpses into the lives of these animals after dark, which is really unique and something we're really lucky to be able to do. Now, where are these little cubs? Dave, maybe just uh, sw swoop down to the left into this little valley here and see. Oh, I, th I saw one of their tails moving there. Let's see if they aren't on their way back up. If you see, just if you zoom in, Dave, just below her and go down a bit to the left, I can see their tails flicking around a little bit lower down. A little bit lower down. Yep. Hello, Sarah. There we go. We can just see their tails flicking about over there tricky. Sarah would like to know how many prides there are in, oh, here we go. Here's a glimpse. Now, for those of you who have been watching Earth Live, you may have got a glimpse of Jamie with her little cubs and a little bit of these at the end. Now, there's three of them in total. They look about six weeks old. And there was another litter of cubs that were found just this evening for the first time that are even slightly smaller than these, I think. So these mothers have got a lot to do, a lot of f feeding to do of these little cubs, which means there's a lot of prey that they're going to need to catch. And at the moment, there's not a huge amount in this general area, but that certainly is going to change as the migration moves up to this area of the Masamara. Hopefully in the next week or two, there'll be hordes and hordes of easy opportunities for these four mothers who've got 13 hungry mouths to feed. They're full of energy. They've been tucked away probably all day while mom was out trying to hunt. Two of the members of this pride, two of the mothers at least, managed to catch a warthog this morning, but the other two have not. So again, good prospects for a little bit later on. Maybe these two hungry mothers may get up and do some hunting. In the meantime, back to James in the migration control. Right, let's take a little sort of bird's eye view of where everyone is. This is, as I've told you, a vast wilderness of 370,000 acres or so. That's, uh, well, very large indeed. 1, 150,000 hectares if you work in Imperial. Here we have Scott and Jamie. You'll meet Jamie just now. They are sitting with the Angama Pride. They're spread about this area with all their cubs. But all the way down here... At the far end of the Masai Mara is Brent Leo Smith, a slightly feral fellow, and you'll meet him just now. But most importantly, he is sitting with one of the most enormous herds of wildebeest I've certainly ever seen, and it's part of the great migration that has come into the Mara. That's where one piece of the herd is now, and when I say the herd, I mean a whole number of herds that make up the body of the wildebeest. There's another enormous grouping around here, and there's another one coming in here into what we call the Mara Triangle, uh, which is, of course, on the western side of the great Mara River. So that's what's going on here. That's the lay of the land. And, of course, over the next eight weeks, we are going to be discussing the movement of this herd and, of course, how it affects these predators and especially the tiny little cubs of the Angama Pride. Between 10 and 13 cubs there are now. Lots of hungry mouths to feed. Let's go and meet some more of them now. There are some more slightly older Angama cubs out in the wide open spaces here in the Masai Mara. Uh, my name is Jamie and this morning Jandre is on camera with me and of course I say morning but we are still quite a long way away from the break of dawn and the rising of the sun and it is still pretty much pitch black out there but with the incredible technology that we have we are actually able to sit and watch these lions without disturbing them, without putting lights on them in any way in full colour which is absolutely phenomenal. So this is the Angama Pride, two of the lionesses and the seven oldest cubs. So the cubs that are around about between six months or around about six months old, all cuddled up together. We have been following these uh, this particular lion pride for four nights in a row. We've learned a great deal about their hunting strategy. And I can tell you that uh, the lionesses in front that we've just looked at are still hungry. Uh, 
as we look at these tiny little cubs a lovely question and good morning to geeky safarian who would like to know if uh, grooming each other is a part of the important social bonding of the various lion members of the pride and the answer is yes absolutely it is they show not just the desire to remove a tick or a parasite but also they show their affection for each other and nobody who's ever seen pride members interact would ever say that they don't have affection and of course each and every single pride member is related to each other now if you would like your question answered in exactly the same way don't forget to send it through on hashtag safari live on twitter now, these lionesses are hungry and this is the time of day when the animals start to descend from the mountain so while i sit and wait i think some of you might be new to these live safaris let's go to james so you can learn more about it well now while I might be sitting comfortably now, it has not always been so here in Kenya. We've come some 2,500 miles all the way from Southern Africa where we do live safaris every single day in the Sabi sand. And we've set up here completely fresh and completely anew. Take a look at how it all happened. The Mara River, Kenya. A remote landscape where wilderness reigns and the people who live here are beholden to Mother Nature. The Safari Live crew journeyed the 2,500 miles north from South Africa to the Mara, allowing viewers across the globe to travel instantaneously to this natural wonderland. Getting you there was tough, but worth it. One balloon, one studio, three trucks, and four guides put thousands of viewers on a personal drive on the world's largest safari. Welcome aboard the ride of a lifetime. This is Safari Live. So a very exciting journey it's been, and we're going to hand you back out to the field very shortly. I just have to tell you, of course, that Robin said you want to see e epic battles uh, over the next eight weeks and wonder, well, that you're going to get in abundance. James, you said some beautiful cheetahs hunting down prey. Well, perhaps we'll show you that. And Phoenix, you said you're watching to learn more about the Great Migration. If you're wondering how on earth those people told us what they want to see, hashtag Safari Live on Twitter is how you can get hold of us. Let us right now go to the far, far east eastern side of the Masai Mara with Brent Leo Smith. Welcome to the pitch black and it's something most people find absolutely terrifying out in the African bush. It makes me really excited. We get to spend time with incredible animals. My name is Brent Leo Smith. I have the incredible Vian Dornbank on camera and we are way on the eastern side of the Mara, not too far from the Tanzanian border to the south. And as you can see, I'm surrounded by pitch black. Now, of course, we've got some incredible things called IR lights, infrared, which we can't see, but now as VM changes over, look at that. Directly behind me is a sleeping lion. Oh dear, VM. There are two sleeping lions. Now, there's actually about eight spread out through these little bushes here. We've been with them the whole night, uh, since daylight yesterday. And uh, they've taken us on a wild goose trace. We've lost them twice. They've been in and out of thickets. They've climbed mountains that we couldn't climb. But fortunately, they came down. We've watched them attempt to hunt four times they have not succeeded so what i'm hoping in this early dark morning and uh, they might get up and get moving i've seen a few stretches i've seen a few yawns all of which are really good signs when it comes to lions getting up on the move so remember if you want to send questions just like denise is doing right now you can do that by using the hashtag safari live on twitter well Denise would like to know, with, would ever any of the lion prides go down to the river to hunt? Most definitely, but they wouldn't leave their territories, Denise. They are quite set in their territories. And uh, these lions are quite far away from the river. How far are we? Probably about as the crow flies. 
15 to 20 kilometers. Now there are lots of little rivers around here that these lions will hunt around. And uh, this pride, we're not quite sure who they are, but we'll get into this a little bit more later because Scott has got lions on the move. Now I'm not sure what she's heard, but she pricked up her ears and got up and there's something that's caught her attention there. I'm not sure if it's that or if she just wants to get away from those cubs. They are continually harassing her. But she may be wanting to move off. And that'll be great for us because, like I said, she is hungry. I'm just going to reposition the vehicle quickly. There she is. Let me swing back a little bit. So it's always a bit tricky after dark following these animals. So I'm just going to make sure I don't take any chances and I don't lose her. Where is she heading off to? What can you hear? Hello, hello to Roan, who's only eight years old and joining in on this live safari. It's great to have you with us. You're interested to know how many times will a lion hunt every week? Well, it all depends on how lucky they get, Roan. Sometimes they could catch something big like a buffalo, and depending on how many lions they have to share it with, they could probably eat for about three, four days, but if there's only a few of them, it could maybe even last them a whole week. Yet if they catch small things like warthog or impala, they'll need to eat more. So it depends on how big the family is and how lucky they are in terms of catching big or small prey. Good question, though, and good, good to have you with us on safari. Now, speaking of hunting, look at how focused she is. What can she hear? Now, their senses are just so much better than ours. She's definitely looking quite focused. She's going to walk straight past our vehicle. Well, it's not only their hearing that's great, of course, their eyesight after dark is really good, as well as their hearing. So, she could have not only heard things, but also smelt them or seen them. Whereas for us, it's very difficult to know. I'm going to swing around this way, Dave. Speaking of lion hunting, we've got some great clips that we're going to show you from the migration control room with James, and we're going to try and do our best to catch up with this lioness. Now, this, what's going on here, is really a very special migration story. We have the herds, as I said, moving up to the north. The lions around where Brent is over there are hunting wildebeest, and they're doing so in a kind of, well, shall we say, ad hoc manner. They're not particularly worried about it. There's so much food around them that they're not really making a huge effort. They're not being particularly skilled or patient. Up here, however, where the Angama pride are now sitting, with 13 hungry mouths to feed, Things are different. These herds have not reached up here yet. They will, we think, within the next few weeks. It might be a few days, it might be a few weeks, but stick with us for eight weeks and you'll be able to see when they arrive up here. And because of that, the Angama pride is now hunting zebra. And these zebra are quite wily. They're resident here. They're not part of the herds of zebra that come with the migration as the vanguard of the migration. And they live in the mountains here on, in the evenings, and then they head down during the day into the valley. And sometimes they're caught in between and these lionesses try to hunt them. And they have failed probably three or four times the last, well, I'd say five times that we've watched them. They've caught one. But other than that, they've had a pretty rough time of it. With 13 hungry mouths to feed, they cannot wait for the herd to arrive back here. Let's go and find out from Jamie if she thinks they're going to go on the hunt. I do indeed think they're going to go on the hunt and in fact James is up at the top of that mountain and we are sitting at the base of it so perhaps there's even a chance he might see it from his lofty perch. Though these lionesses are hungry and what we have noticed because of course there is a resident herd of zebra that doesn't go and migrate they stay here all year round and every single night and remember we've been out with these lions pretty much every single night. 
uh, every single night the, the zebra have gone up into the mountain and then as dawn breaks they start to come back down into the open plains and I'm pretty sure that that is why these lionesses are here because yesterday they caught a warthog but it wasn't a particularly big meal and whilst a two of the four lionesses I think kind of got the lion's share those growing cubs are still particularly hungry and they're at that sort of six month stage which is where they go through an extraordinary growth spurt plus it's been cold it's chilly it's actually freezing here this morning and uh, Jandre is shivering so if his camera works a bit shaky you'll have to forgive him he's been exposed uh, to the elements all evening but the cubs are going to be cold which in turn uses up more energy and they're definitely going to be hungry and what that means of course for all of you is that you absolutely shouldn't go anywhere we are going to be taking a short break but remember this is live from Kenya and absolutely anything can happen so stay tuned because that lioness is just about to get up Sorry, John, I didn't mean to say your camera work was shaky. It came out wrong. I was trying to get them into the, the feel of the morning. Why have we got... I completely forgot about our internet viewers. I'm so sorry. I completely, completely forgot. I'm busy talking about how I threw Jandre under the bus, which I really didn't mean to do. So I do apologize to all of you. I completely, completely forgot about our internet show. I was trying to work out who was driving along behind us. So we've been out with the Angamas for the last four nights in a row. Hey, sweet things. And it's been fascinating to watch the way that they work. And actually, They've almost, I guess you could say, they've almost been creatures of habit in the way that they've hunted. They go to exactly the same places, but it's the only areas in their particular territory where there's actually game for them uh, to hunt. There you go. Everybody's enjoying a nice, peaceful bath. That cub in the middle has got so lucky. <laughs> Couldn't look happier. <laughs> and I promise you, I can barely even see the lions. I can see white dots of their bellies at this point. So what you're seeing is actually really, truly astounding. There we go. That's what I was expecting. You can see, look, she's empty bellied. So she at least hasn't eaten. I wonder, she obviously wasn't present when the warthog was being consumed, or else she missed out on the opportunity. Let me just have a look. Chandra, could you do me a huge favor and just zoom in on her left ear or her right ear? Either ear, both ears would be ideal. Just turn your head, sweetheart. I just want to see if. Because we're missing the three not so young cubs anymore, not at least the youngest cubs, the six weeks old ones. I just wanted to see if this was the mum. No, it's not her. Hey girl. Well, and we are up and moving. You're going to take us on our usual path where I get stuck. Kirsty, just to let you know, if you are talking to me, I'm not getting your comments. All right, let's send you over to James. Oh, hello, everybody. On the internet. It's been quite a week, I'll tell you. You know, we've worked very hard to set this place up. Um, it hasn't been easy. 
Uh, I'm not an interior decorator by nature. I think we've done okay so far. Uh, the color scheme, barring that blind, perhaps I think is okay. Can you hear me? What's your sound? Good. You can hear me. Yeah, I've got levels. You've got levels? Kirsten, have you got levels? Oh. Don't know what that was. Welcome back to your very own live migration safari. Hashtag Safari Live is how you must get hold of us. Send us your questions and comments. We'd love to hear from you. That is hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Now, you've seen those lions getting up and going off on the hunt. It's not always easy for them and the life of the lion in the Masai Mara. Well, sometimes it's paradise, sometimes it's pain. Have a look at this. Lions are the apex predators of the Maasai Mara, perfectly adapted to this ancient wilderness. They slink through tall grass, but prime lion territory like the Mara comes at a price. The injuries on Scar have made him one of the most famous lions in the world. He and his coalition lay claim to the northern reaches of this wild expanse. There is often time to relax and enjoy the paradise that is the Masai Mara. When the migration arrives, food is abundant. The challenge is to catch it. live with our amazing Angama pride and of course that scene that you saw a bit earlier with the lion hunting the wildebeest that was one of the Angama lionesses that Jandre filmed actually so it just goes to show these lionesses are truly formidable huntresses and I think that's what they have in mind for this morning as well there you go look you can see them stopping looking listening accompanied by their seven bundles of trouble and these cubs are just at the age where life gets a bit more difficult for the lionesses because the cubs just want to go on every single hunt that they possibly can they want to follow along they don't want to stay put but that's the wonderful thing about the migration coming on its way the fact that life will become just that little bit easier for these lionesses Now, you, Fem, lovely question from you, and a question that I think lots of people ask, ask themselves or ask of experts, and that is whether or not lions keep the same role when hunting. And the answer to that is there's no set formula. It very much depends upon where each lioness is, but they are amazing at coordinating their hunts. So if one happens to take the lead, then the others know how to fall into place and support her. And if that one lioness has, mi has missed what she was trying to catch, then the other lionesses are there to take her place or to swap over. So there's no set positions. They don't necessarily plan it out and have tactical ways where one only will lead the hunt and the others will act as the, as the ambushers. But it is something that is a very interesting thing to watch, the way that they plan their hunts. Lovely question, and thank you very much. Let's go across to Scott, who's not far away from us, with another lion on the move. Well, what's interesting is that this lioness seems to be heading straight towards Jamie and the rest of the Angama pride. And at the rate she's going, I'm sure it's not going to take long for her to reunite with the two sisters and those seven cute little cubs. Now, it's going to be very tricky for us to, to follow her through this long grass. She's quite far away from us now. But as Dave zooms out, you may, we may even be able to see where Jamie is. If you just go a little bit more to the left, Dave. There we go. There you can see where Jamie's vehicle is. 
So she's obviously just moving around, as you can see, and the lion's heading straight towards her. So that's going to be a great thing to see when they reunite. Lion, lions are incredibly social animals. So when they've been apart for a while and they reunite with one another, they become very, very affectionate and cuddly and caring, which is quite interesting because often people only can think about their harsh side when they're taking down prey and chasing away hyena, but they also do have a soft side. Okay, so, like I said, it's going to be tricky for us to follow her from here, and we've lost track of her in the sea of grass. So let's just keep on heading down this road and see if things don't get any better. Which I don't feel too confident about, so we're going to send you on back to Brent and see what his cats are up to. Well, one of our cats has just got up. We're going to move a little bit forward to see what. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. There are, of course, some technical difficulties with, uh, well, broadcasting in high definition out of a 370,000-acre wilderness. Now, that piece that I'm talking about there, 370,000 acres, is just up top here but it is part of a much greater area of some 10,000 square miles, which is massive indeed. And it begins, funnily enough, not today, but appropriately in January, down here on the short grass plains of the Serengeti. They've recovered after the rains, and what happens is all the little wildebeest are born here. 500,000 of them are born there in January and February. And that's very sweet, but not quite as sweet as when you think about the fact that when they get back here, only 250,000 of them will have survived. The rest will have been eaten or fallen by the wayside. Then, come June, well, no, in fact, April or May, they're normally rutting over there. And what that means, of course, is that the males are setting up little territories, and while the males are setting up their little territories, they're fighting over the females, and, well, if they're very lucky, they'll be able to mate. Then they come up here, and it is here that we have begun our story. That giant herd of some two million animals has now split into three. And they're moving up in three areas into the Maasai Mara, onto the oat grass plains, which will nourish them before their trip back down to the south. All in all, it's not actually an enormous distance. It's probably only about 200 miles that they travel in straight lines, but of course they go to and from all the time, so it's probably about double that that they do all the way up. So call it an, well, around about 800 mile trip. One of the most dangerous things, of course, for them to do is cross the rivers, and we had one of our favorite and first crossings at Kildesac Crossing just the other day. Take a look. There you can see the cul-de-sac crossing on the Mara River. It is a very special part of what we call home and where most of the crossings happen. We saw our first crossing at cul-de-sac in the northern Mara, and for one young zebra, it was the most harrowing experience imaginable. The massive crocodiles of this region of the river converged on their first migration meal. At one stage, just a hundred feet from the bank, it looked like the helpless young yearling might escape. But it was not to be. The zebra had drifted down to an impossibly steep bank during the struggle, and a flotilla of giant, hungry reptiles converged. They'd been waiting for nine months. The outcome here was never in doubt, but despite facing the most overwhelming odds, the brave zebra fought on to the end pushing off the rocky river bed and trying desperately to kick the perfectly designed riverine killers. You can see there it's just about to drown and I'm sorry if this is a little bit difficult for sensitive viewers, but this is what happens countless times. Once the zebra drowned, the feast quickly became a frenzy and what the hippo were doing here, chasing crocodiles or looking for jerky, is not entirely clear. So what a spectacular sighting that was. We're about to see the rest of the herd arrive at the Mara River, and they too are going to have to run the gauntlet of those spectacularly large reptiles, everyone's favorite natural villain. Let's head straight back to Jamie now. 
Now, from the sinister nature of the crocodiles lurking in the Mara River, let's move on to something slightly more light-hearted because Scott's Lioness has joined the rest of the Pride and they are having so much fun with their cubs. Just watch this. <laughs> you can actually hear the thudding of their footsteps and these lionesses are just playing with each other. It takes us back to the question that we had earlier about a playful grooming and the bonding between them. It is amazing to watch and it does bring us to Jeff's question as well when Jeff is wondering what is the social ranking Oh, sorry, Jess. Jess, you were wondering about the social ranking within Prides. There actually isn't really a social ranking, which is what's so fascinating, as the only social or truly... So <laughs> that cup is incredible. As the only truly social cat, I mean, they're all pretty much equally ranked, although sometimes the older lionesses with more experience will often take the lead. But there's no huge ranking in within lion, or no permanent ranking system. Look at these cubs. They are so happy to see the lionesses. And remember, every <laughs> every single time these lionesses have to go out hunting, they have to leave these cubs in a place that is filled with hyenas and other potential threats. And every time they leave them, they never know if those cubs are still going to be there when they get back. So I imagine in my own mind that each and every single time the lionesses come back, they must be hugely relieved to find their family intact still. What a special thing that is. Now, if you would like your question answered, or perhaps you have some thoughts on that, these special cats, send them through on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. This is just too stunning for words. And the light that you're seeing, by the way, illuminating the, the lions, is the light of the moon, which is gorgeous. But they are getting away from us, and they're going towards the forest. So let us go and catch up with them. Hold on. I have become very familiar with traversing this area off-road. And Wayne, oh goodness, hold on everybody, it's a bit bumpy. You want to know if lions hunt more during the day or at night? To be honest with you, these lionesses hunt constantly until they get what they need. And what that means is that if they don't succeed during the night, they will carry on during the day. Mostly though, as a general rule, lions will be more active at night, so they will hunt more at night. Oh, this is going to be our lions disappearing, I think, for the morning. I hope not, though. Let's hope they stick around. But Brent has also got the biggest cat in Africa. Well, we do. Now, we've got one of the biggest prides in the Mara as well. Now, you're going to have to forgive uh, some of my pronunciation here. Uh, it is the Olai Muntiak Pride, uh, all known as the Tupa Pride, which is uh, both... Um, Maasai words. Alai Muntiak is the name of a village uh, further to the east of us and also an entrance gate into the Maasai Mara. Oh, this is looking very promising, these stretches. And her head goes flat. Now, uh, Tsupa, which is their nickname, is uh, means the really good or really great pride. Uh, a really big pride, over 20 individuals. So lots of mouths to feed. And I'm really, really hoping. Well, I'm not hoping, I know that there's a male lion, I'd say less than a kilometer from us now. I've just heard him roaring just seconds before you came to us. That's why her head was up. And it is such an incredible sound out there. And uh, for those of you wondering a bit about lion roars and behaviors, uh, what lions roar for is to proclaim territory or to find each other. Those are the two only two reasons that lions would roar. And uh, she lifted her head when she heard him roar and decided she didn't want to listen to what he had to say or knew what he was saying and still didn't want to listen. Well, Julie, oh, is he gonna start roaring again? Look, there's a couple of heads popping up. Is that Julie? There we wait, wait, wait. It sounds like you might be getting closer. Vim, can you hear that on ambient? Oh, he's definitely getting closer. Look, look at them jump up. No. 
That sounds like at least two males roaring. You might not be able to hear it. They're directly behind us. Can see how the females have reacted. Now it's gonna be interesting to see if they roar back. Sometimes even though there might be a coalition of males, which Judy has asked about, but I don't have enough time to talk about, um, how many there are in the Mara? There are lots and lots. But we're going to see if we can find one of these coalitions. It seems like the ladies aren't interested in hearing them because they might steal all the food because big male lions are greedy gutsers who takes the lion's share. And uh, you never know. They might find these girls by smell, but I think I'm going to go try find those boys by sound. And you're going to have to come back straight after this short break to see if I have any success. Hi guys, let's go see if we can find some male lions. Yes, we're gonna go see if we can find your cohorts. Okay. While I do that, let's go back to Jamie, who's a far 50 plus kilometers away from where we are. Very, very far away indeed in a sort of, I think, let me think about it. Well, I'm essentially in a northerly direction. And this is going to be our last view, I think, of the Angama Pride for a little while as they dash their way underneath the hill that is home to the Angama Lodge and the Angama Pride, and hence the name. So Angama sits right on top of the mountain, and this is where the Pride spend pretty much all of their time, and they've gone through many names in their history, the Out of Africa Pride, uh, the Olololo Pride, although there are lionesses that are still in this area called the Olololo Pride. And off go the four members of the Angama Pride and seven older cubs. Which means that the mothers of the two youngest sets of cubs have left them for now as they've moved off into the forest. I might try and find them on the other side. I don't think so though. I think that is that. I'll try and see if I can get us the last view. Ah, huh. I'm sure my headlights were working a moment ago, Jandre. Oh well, who needs them? I can do this in the dark. I think. Hey, we could have actually made it down here. I think. I can't really see. It's probably not a good idea without actual headlights. Maybe not. Maybe not such a good idea. Right, while I try and figure out where my headlights have gone, so I've got to find a road again, let's go back to Scott, who hopefully is on a road. Well, I'm glad at least you did get to see the Angama Pride playing around with that lioness that just joined them. And now I'm going to try and find the final piece to the Angama Pride puzzle. That is one lioness and three of the smallest cubs. They're probably only three or four weeks old. And Jamie was the first person to see them this evening. So really exciting stuff. We're gonna head back into the area where Jamie left both the mother and the cubs a little bit earlier, which is just up this little track here. And I'm just gonna drive nice and slowly, make sure we don't startle the cubs. It's very important that, especially after dark, you just take it slow. You don't know if there could be any hyenas lurking around, and hyenas will kill lion cubs. So you just don't want to make any extra attention or fuss to a certain area. So we are going to be treading lightly as we use the... are doing a good job dodging us this evening. We lost three lioness at about two o'clock this morning. That were Jamie and I followed for about three kilometers. They were seriously on the move. And now Jamie's just lost the Angamas, but she knows this little neck of the woods. She's been spending a lot of time with this pride of lion there, so 
Hopefully her knowledge of this area will help. I'm just trying to find a GPS coordinate that Jamie used to marcate where that den was and it's probably around 500 meters, 600 meters away. But we could bump into mom along the way. So we'll just take it nice and slow. She could be anywhere in this long grass. Whew. It's cold this morning. But not as bad as yesterday, I don't think. I think it's just by the time it gets to the wee hours and you've spent so long out in the cold weather, your body just starts to freeze a little bit. Oh, what are those? Are those some buffalo? Okay, well, let's take a stop and have a look at these buffalo. So we have some Cape Buffalo here, and we're not too far away from where Jamie left Lioness and Three Cubs, the only missing part of the Angama Pride puzzle in terms of you guys meeting them tonight. So we're on our way back to where Jamie did leave them. Who knows whether the mom will be there or the cubs or both. The last we heard was that they actually went, the, the mother left them alone, probably to go and look for a meal. Maybe she's been lucky, who knows? Maybe she's stalking these buffalo. Although, it would be a very, very big task for her to take down one of these huge beasts on her own. And even these are dangerous for young little cubs. They do not tolerate lions, buffalo, especially herds like this. They can be quite a force against lion. And even though lions may surprise them and ambush them initially, causing the herd to turn and flee, once the herds kind of regained focus, they muster up their troops and head on back to chase the lion off if they've managed to pull down one of the herd members. Doesn't look like they're too concerned about anything now, just chewing the cud. So let's continue on towards where Jamie did leave those cubs. And while we head off to find the cubs, we're going to head you off to the migration control room to chat with James. Yes, we are indeed heading over to the migration control room. This is where we find ourselves. And I just thought I would show you this here, the village. Well, no, that's not James Henry. That's, that chap's name is Kakenya. And uh, <laughs> he lives in Olomachek village. And that's where Brent was talking about earlier. Now, his lions, if we follow just where Kakenya lives into the village, uh, not into the village, into the reserve here, Brent's lions were hunting the wildebeest today. And they had a couple of narrow misses, probably three or four that we watched earlier on today, and they have failed so far, and then they went to sleep because they're very tired. Now, many people think that the GNU looks and behaves in a surprisingly stupid fashion, but somehow it manages to know where the grass is, and we think that they follow the rains. We also know, of course, that their story is one of the most epic stories in the natural world. Have a look at this. Every summer, millions of wildebeest, zebra, and Thompson's gazelle stream out of the Serengeti into the Maasai Mara. Hungry predators lurk as the herds prepare to swim the gauntlet that is the Mara River. The desire for greener pastures builds to a breaking point. They're now streaming in from all over the plains. Look at the crocodile coming after them! Oh my goodness! That one's down. That is unbelievable. They're just terrified, poor things. Well done, clever little thing. Make a noise, your mum will come and get you. But back on dry land lies more danger. Here's a lion! There's a lion right next to us! Predators await exhausted travelers. Here we go. Look at this. She's got it. A 
As darkness falls, the herds gather for safety because the night belongs to predators. She looks like she's flanking left. They've killed a little zebra. Look at those hyenas coming in. We're witnessing one of the most ancient battles there is in nature. Hyenas versus lions. Now, Kobe, you're just 15 years old, a budding young naturalist, and you want to know what percentage of the wildebeest make it on their route? How many of them make it back to the south? Well, probably only about 50% of the youngsters that are born, and then, of course, a number of them must die as adults on the way. And what's interesting, Kobe, is that something like 60% of the death that happens on that migration route happens entirely without the effect of predators. So it's disease or injury or old age or what we call natural causes. So that's quite interesting. There's a huge amount of flesh out there rotting in the sun being used by scavengers like the hyenas you've just seen on that roll-in and also, of course, by the vultures, hundreds and hundreds of vultures. Now, we are going to be following the story over the next eight weeks. We've got the zebra in front. They are the vanguard of the herd, then the wildebeest, then, of course, the Thompson's gazelles. And we are going to be doing this at 11 o'clock Eastern time on Friday night every week. Okay, so for the next seven weeks, 11 p.m. Eastern time on Nat Geo Wild is how you can see us. If you don't happen to live in the United States, well, then you can watch us on the internet and all you need to do is Google Safari Live. Let's head straight back down onto the Mara floor with the spectacular lions of the Angama Pride. The lions of the Angama Pride have disappeared, but this is their home. And this is what they've been after over the last four days. A herd of zebra that are the permanent residents of this particular spot. But I think they know somehow, instinctively, that there are another couple of hundred thousand zebra on their way in this direction. And what an extraordinary experience these TV shows are going to be over the coming weeks. We get to experience the migration alongside with you and with the lions like the Angama Pride. And I mean, I've spent most of my time getting to know them. And the lions like the Angama Pride, we can actually watch them experience it. And for the cubs, we can actually see them experience it for the very, very first time. And watch the way that things change. For now, though, the herd is not yet here, and the Angama lions have to focus on hunting the zebra that live around the slope. And I actually think that those lionesses have gone off to stash the older cubs and to leave them somewhere safe and secure away from hyenas before they try one last time before the break of dawn and they lose the advantage of the darkness. And I know it's hard to believe that it is dark, but I promise you, when I look up, I can't even really see the zebra. And Nina, there's a very good question, because I've been pondering about how the zebra know that the migration is on its way. And Nina would like to know if the permanent residents ever change their mind about being permanent residents and actually join the migration. And Nina, I think that you'll find that actually regularly happens, because of course, once the migration arrives and the permanent members mingle with the different herds, because remember, it's several different herds, they, that they might decide to join up. A female might have been taken into a male's harem. So yes, I think that is something that is quite fluid. I wonder if the if the permanent zebra look upon the migratory zebra with great awe and wonder. Or perhaps they look down upon them. They consider themselves superior because they don't have to go jumping through the Mara River. I don't know. But it will be fascinating to watch this whole thing play out right in front of our eyes. The zebra look pretty peaceful at the moment. They're across in the distance, past or towards those twinkling lights, is the Great Mara River. And that is where, in the next few weeks, hundreds of thousands of zebra first and then wildebeest will come streaming across in this direction. And I think these little zebra can be thankful that they don't have to do that. And all of it, of course, based around the flourishing of the various grasses. Well, it's not just the various grasses. In fact, it's mostly this one grass here, and it is called red oat grass, Thamida triandra, for those of you who speak Latin. 
which I imagine are probably none of you. And it's this red oat grass that grows tall in the long rains that happen between June and September, and they grow long and they produce beautiful leaves, and it is that that nourishes the astonishing numbers of creatures that come through here. And why, you might ask, do these grasses grow here? Well, this area is actually fairly tectonically unstable. In other words, there have been a lot of recent volcanoes around this area. By recent, I don't mean in human terms, I mean in geological terms. And that means that the soil is tremendously rich. It's covered in ash, which of course is filled with nutrients from the bowels of the earth, if you like, and they have nourished these plains for millennia. And that is why there are so many magnificent animals in amongst the red oat grass plains, which I think is rather spectacular. Now, I believe that Scott Dyson has decided that far be it from him to be an observer of the migration, he has decided to take part. <laughs> I couldn't resist getting a piece of the red oat grass we were driving through, as James is telling you all about it. And there's a whole bunch of different grasses actually that we're driving through, but most of it is red oat grass. Sadly, the lioness and three tiny little cubs were nowhere to be seen where Jamie left them earlier today. So, we're going to just continue up along this road. They may not be too far away. They may have just moved slightly. They're not using a den site at the moment. They kind of just get hidden in thickets, I think. I mean, it was, they were only seen for the first time today, so we don't actually know too much about them. But I'm guessing the mother moves them from place to place, thicket to thicket. to watch. You're interested to know if the wildebeest are aware of all of the dangers they face in the gauntlet of the migration. And it's a good question. I don't think they do. They don't act like they do. I guess there's so many of them that maybe the fact their sheer numbers make the losses not feel as great as they are. But there certainly are many, many obstacles and challenges along this migration. Jamie's found something interesting, so why don't you rush over and see what it is? I have indeed, and it's about to disappear. Hopefully we can catch up with it before the end of your safari. So let's just race forward, because of course we've talked about the effect of the migration on the amazing lions, but there's more than lions out here that will take advantage of the migration. Is it still there, Jandre? Let's see if we can spot it somewhere in front of us. I hope it is still there. Let's glance off into the distance because of course as... Oh dear, I think it's vanished. Oh there it is, Chandra. There we go, just needed a spotlight to spot it. <laughs> always, always lurking around at the base of this mountain that is the clan of hyenas. They pay visits to our camp on a nightly basis and come charging through and whoop outside our tents and they too will be eagerly anticipating the arrival of the migration and remember of course that spotted hyenas whilst they have a terrible reputation as thieves are in fact highly highly accomplished hunters as well and I think that's another creature that we're going to get to know or at least another clan that we're going to get to know very well during the up-and-coming migration series Oh well, there goes the hyena. I think that's pretty much it. Let's see if we can spot anything else on the base of the mountain. Nope, all is quiet here. No wildebeest streaming across the plain. The same, of course, cannot be said for Brent. Well, that's definitely true because we are right in the middle of one of the largest herds of the migration and that's why the lions are so fat and happy well not all of them and we thought we might be lucky i'm pretty sure that male lion is somewhere within 50 or 60 meters maybe even closer we just can't find him but of course remember next week friday night 10 p.m edt we will be going live again from the Maasai Mara for more magnificence. 
Now you can see these Vildis are snorting. They're a little bit unrelaxed. I'm going to take one more scan with my thermal cam. Oh, my, not my thermal cam, my thermal spotter. I can see, um, while looking through the screen, probably half a million wildebeest all around us. And uh, it is unfortunate I just don't see a male lion. But we will definitely see lots of male lions in the coming weeks as we explore the magnificence that is the Maasai Mara. Look at that. Remember, this is 100% live, unscripted, bringing you the joys of one of the most magnificent parts of Africa for the next seven-week adventure. I can't wait to see what we find next. Will the wildebeest get all the way to the Angama Pride? Will Scarface make an appearance will the paradise pride be waiting in ambush at the crossings and those monster crocodiles waiting for poor hapless wildebeest and zebra it's all going to be happening live from the Maasai Mara you better be there for the greatest live wildlife experience ever